Welcome back, and thank you, panelists, for your insightful and, and really very, very important research and uh, methodologies that you've shown to us today. If you don't mind, we'll start with some very specific questions and then go to sort of the bigger, more theoretical ones or the more philosophical ones. Um, Kazmin, uh, we have two questions for you, very specific. Why was DIVA and DASIM in this used in this study and not more advanced software, um, such as those that already solve some of your research problems? Could you respond, Kazmin? Uh, yeah, sure, happy to respond. Well, we, firstly, we consider that DIVA for Rhino is a tool that is quite widely used, at least in the UK. And this is something that we have been using also. Um, but also other tools. I mean, as I mentioned previously, uh, we are also planning to use uh, other tools like uh, Honeybee Plus, uh, used to, to use R country, which is an algorithm to R trace. I'm not very really sure what um, you know the person who asked the question meant by other more advanced tools. I mean, it would have been helpful to have some names. Um, we are looking into this, of course. Uh, we have actually um, looked at other tools that are uh, available out there. Uh, you know, I wouldn't name them necessarily, but we looked at, uh, at, the, at the radiance parameters specifically that they use, and we noticed that uh, there are some yeah, different settings, let's say low settings, right. uh, more, 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 more precisely. Uh, so yeah, I hope Wait. this answers the question. Th yes, thank you. And Arlind, does uh, daylight factor take into account the surrounding buildings? And what do you suggest for a residential study? Uh, yes, definitely. First, it is good practice to model the ground plane and also surrounding buildings, simplified. And also it is a requirement by most standards and also in the EN 17037 daylight standard. Great. And oh. for residential studies, uh, it, it depends on uh, uh, the time the, and the level of uh, expertise that you have. So starting with the daylight factor with uh, any of the tools out there, open source uh, or, or uh, VLAX daylight visualizer or ladybug tools, it's a great way using the daylight factor and then moving on to climate based metrics, definitely. Yeah, there was one other question related to this. Why, why was the DF chosen as the standard of comparison when DA is more sensitive to context and weather? It was for Cosmin, but anyone may want to respond. You just mentioned something about yes, it. I, I made this comparison of uh, spatial daylight autonomy, daylight factor, and also uh, using the second method of the standard. So it's similar to the uh, daylight autonomy, but it's not using occupied hours, but the, the actual daylight hours. So for half of the daylight hours, uh, is, uh, are we reaching that uh, illuminance level of 300 lux, for example, or minimum target of 100 lux for the whole floor area? For 300 lux, it is for a fraction of the plane, so 50%. And so I was comparing this because that's, uh, that's the interesting thing of the standard, because uh, these metrics are computed spatially. So, uh, so the median of the daylight factor, 2.2%, uh, percent, uh, it's half of the floor area. And also the spatial daylight autonomy, we can, uh, it's, it's the same. So, uh, those are, so because they are spatially, they can be spatially compared. And uh, that matters in also in understanding the performance and, and moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Kasmin, uh, please, please. Because like, um, the, I mean, daylight fact, in, in Sweden, the, the, there's a requirement. So every project has to uh, make a simulation. And uh, already we are struggling to get this very simple daylight simulation that is daylight factor. So it will be a further threshold to get people to make more advanced simulations. Uh, I've, I'll, I'm sure we'll get there, but it's going to be it's going to be a process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, can, can I come in at this point? Yes, we have short time, John. So jump in very concisely, yeah. please. The, the daylight factor was included as an option in the European standard, really as a sort of transitional feature. To, uh, to, uh, so it wasn't just an overnight switch from daylight factor to climate based. And there was this kind of interim approach. But um, yeah, we realized immediately that but because of the way they're defined, it, it would actually be easier to, to get the measure with climate based than with, than with the daylight factor. And so in other ways, it actually served as a, as a useful encouragement to the adoption of climate based. And I should just add, I actually really wanted to get rid of the overcast sky. I think the daylight factor is a much better metric if you use the uniform sky. The CIE overcast sky, I think, was a dreadful blunder. 
never should have happened. <laughs> okay, thank you, John. Um, I, I have a, a, a little bit stepping back a little bit and looking a little bit more broadly. Maybe Marie Claude, maybe you'd like to respond. I think for uh, if we look at education, lots of times daylight um, and more advanced calculations are not possible to do within the curriculum of architectural or architectural studies. Um, on the other hand, what you've expressed today is just how important it is to do this deep dive, this research, take into account a lot of factors. Um, so I, I sort of have two questions. Is it possible to add more factors, things of quality, differences for different geographic locations in your calculations? And if it's not in schools, and if we're training architects and they're not familiar with a lot of these tools, where would you embed it in the process of design or how would you implement it uh, in the process of design? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big question uh, because I've been teaching in architecture schools for 25 years or something. Um, and it is true that we do not have time to go much beyond the daylight factor. And already when they get that competence, we're very happy. Um, however, on the other side, I see that students are now coming from another generation. They've, they were born with a smartphone in their hands. They're used to much more complex digital manipulation, so to say. Um, and I think with made us go one uh, really leap forward was when the grasshopper tools came because that's something that was accessible to architects because of the visual programming aspect of it and it's also a playful type of programming and and that was very interesting to me to see that uh, students in the third year of architecture, they started grasping that not just because they had to, but because it was fun to do it. Mm. And I think that um, now there are lots of students who, who play with uh, Rhino Grasshopper and they learn it quite quickly on their own. And they're, they're used also to go and fetch information uh, on YouTube and you know all sorts of places. So I, I, I am optimistic for uh, the future. I think that in fact, we're gonna see, we're gonna be very surprised. Hmm. Uh, this is one of my ex-students <laughs> here and, uh, <laughs> and he didn't do too bad. Yes. <laughs> oh. I was, so. say, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, mesmerized the first time I saw Grasshopper in, in one of the classes. It was something like back then it was just something very small. It was yeah. starting right. and I was like, wow, this has so many possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. But, but in that sense, uh, in that sense, Alejandro, um, where do you see all of these calculations in this research being utilized? In the in the, in sort of the the design process, mm. is it architects? Is it consultants? Mm. Is it a construction company? Where where will this be, and why? So we're we're in our experience, <coughs> uh, it works much better when the architect has some kind of an understanding, some kind of competence that they can do. This is why we're developing all these tools that are uh, easy and usable for architects. Because um, I mean, we we do performance analysis on different ma things. We do energy, we do microclimate, we do wind. And, uh, and they're all connected to design, but uh, f daylight is especially connected to design. And we think that and the person who's in charge of the design, the architects, sh should have a, a special competence in daylight. Like it's, it's specially connected to the early stages of, of design, like the, the things, the, this, the decisions that you take in, in the early stages, they are crucial. And, like, uh, and, and these are usually the, the um, external consultants are not involved in these early uh, stages. So it's very important that the architects have some way of, uh, of owning the question. Great. Mm. Kevin, would you give the last question yes. for our last minute and a yes, half sure. we have with these panelists? Sure, yes. So uh, I wanted to ask this to, to John and say, in my experience, I've met with clients uh, and I've shared with them detailed simulation results. And sometimes they look at me with cross-eyed and say, I, I care about you know, poetry and beauty. These metrics, they're useless to me. And so I often find myself trying to translate the metrics into, into something that they get excited about. I just wondered if you have any uh, similar experiences trying to use metrics to support design. 
Absolutely. I mean, the, how you present is is very important. Um, but I'd say that it takes five minutes tops to for people to get aperture based modeling. And when they they see examples like that simple one I showed you, I mean, they get it almost instantly. Great. So I, I think that is a way for architects and designers to to kind of take ownership of of the, of this. Yeah. You know, better ownership and and to see it through from the from the envelope to the inside yep Arlen what about that the answer to that question uh, well d definitely I, I myself an architect so I uh, implement this in my own work but also need I work with a firm so I need to also to communicate the results with other people and uh, that matters a lot and uh, and there's not a simple one answer one size fits all for a every person some person have more interest yeah. uh, they understand it very quickly some need more time and they need more help yeah. some people prefer to see the full color range some people prefer to see the categorized results uh, so the, uh, so we need also every time to think of the audience yeah, even if it's our colleagues mm -hmm. uh, a client or anyone and I'd also like to say something inspirational that daylight is a uh, global solution. So wherever we are in the world, we can work with daylight. Mm -hmm. And uh, and still, uh, after Corbusier said it, but it's still relevant today. So to introduce the sun is uh, the new and most imperative duty of the architect to regenerate our health and also to design better buildings. Perfect way to end this session. Let me just thank all our speakers. It's been a pleasure to hear you today. And Kevin, when should we return? Yes, indeed. Uh, about a half hour at 4.30 from now, we'll have our final session for day two of the Daylight Symposium. And the topic will be glare and control. Sounds good. Join us again soon. Thank you.